I'd like to um, introduce Brian. Brian's a member of the W uh, HNA. Um, he attended our second symposium and our third symposium, of course. He's the um, author of a book on the British Navy called The Longest Campaign, a retired army officer and a recipient of the Excellence in Military History Award from the US Army Center for Military History in the Association of the United States Army. He's working on some forthcoming works, which he hasn't really discussed very much, but I'm very curious about that, Brian. Maybe later on you can, you can share with us. And I'm gonna cut my comments at that point. I'm gonna mute myself and I'm gonna turn the screen over to Brian, who's gonna be talking about the Atlantic campaign, some, un some common myths and underreported facts. So thank you, and Brian. Thank you, Vince, and thank you for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here and have an opportunity to talk with everyone. Uh, I'm gonna start the presentation by reading a short passage of uh, passages from an article that I wrote for Worship World Magazine about a year ago, um, which I, I think is a good way to introduce the topic that we're going to be discussing today. So please bear with me. In reviewing the maritime conflict during World War II, many researchers will inherently focus upon the Pacific theater where the United States Navy fought in an epic struggle against the naval forces of Imperial Japan. Waged over vast expanses of ocean, and featuring immense fleet actions that often involve dozens or even hundreds of principal warships. The Pacific conflict clearly exemplified traditional view of naval warfare. This was highlighted by many notable battles, including Midway, the Marianas, and Lady Gulf. Beyond this, the campaign also featured dozens of amphibious landings, a successful submarine interdiction campaign, and the unprecedented ordeal of the kamikaze onslaught. Moving the inquiry closer to Europe, some naval enthusiasts might be inclined to focus on the struggle in the Mediterranean. Although lacking the same scope as the Pacific campaign, the Mediterranean conflict also had its share of maritime combat, including the bombardment of the Vichy fleet at Mirs el Kabir, the fleet air arm raid against Toronto, the Battle of Cape Metapan, the multi-service effort to interdict access maritime traffic to Africa, the epic struggle to maintain the island fortress of Malta, and the execution of numerous amphibious landings in both North Africa and Southern Europe. Still, as momentous as these campaigns were, neither constituted the premier maritime contest of the war. Instead, the distinction for this goes to the Atlantic and coastal waters of Northern Europe, where the forces of Britain and Germany fought a life and death struggle to determine the outcome of the war. This was not an ostentatious contest. There were no major fleet actions comparable to Midway, Lady Gulf, or even Cape Matapan. Instead, the contest was, could better be described as a long and grueling slog in which the competing forces fought a multitude of minor and medium actions under often difficult conditions over a six-year period. In many respects, the conflict in the Atlantic and surrounding area would, would seem an unlikely candidate to be the war's premier maritime contest. But in terms of its duration, scope, and relevance, that is precisely what it was. All right, so let's talk about this a little bit now. What was the Atlantic campaign truly the war's premier maritime contest? Uh, well, in terms of its duration, it was the longest continuous campaign of the Second World War, running almost six years from September 1939 to May 1945. In terms of its scope, one example of that was the fact that more ships were sunk in the Atlantic theater during the war than all the other theaters combined. Uh, so obviously there's a great deal of, of combat that was associated with this theater. And in terms of its relevance, which in my mind is the most important thing here, um, I think we, we, we're gonna have to stand back a little bit and take a look at the greater global context to fully understand this relevance. And I realize that some of what I'm going to be talking about is, is fairly rudimentary, but I think it's still important to hash this out in order to really get a picture of this. Uh, in my mind, the Second World War really boils down to a contest between six major powers, uh, divided evenly three on each side. For the Allies, you have the British Commonwealth of Nations, the Soviet Union, and the United States. For the Axis, of course, you have Germany, the Kingdom of Italy, and the Japanese Empire. Now, beyond this breakdown, the war could further be picked down into two major theaters of operation. There was the European theater and there was the Asia Pacific theater. And of those two theaters, uh, authorities at the time and, and most of them and since then have all acknowledged that the war in Europe was the predominant theater 
of, of the two, and that of the Axis powers, Germany was the, the main threat uh, of the three Axis nations. And all three of the Allied powers put the bulk or all of their war effort in defeating Germany. In the case of the Soviet Union, they put 100% of their war effort against the Germans. And it wasn't until Germany was defeated that they turned their attention towards Japan. In case of the British Empire, uh, again, this is just a ballpark figure, but probably somewhere in the range of 80 to 90 percent of the overall British effort went in uh, to uh, fighting the European conflict. And even the United States, where it's true that the United States Navy put most of its emphasis in the war in the Pacific, but overall, the overall American war effort was still oriented towards the European war. So this was a collective undertaking, and for the Western allies involved, in my mind, uh, they waged war in, in, against the European Axis, conducting five major campaigns. Uh, those campaigns were the, the Maritime Campaign, which is primarily located you know, and centered in the Atlantic. Uh, there was the Africa Campaign, the Southern Europe Campaign, uh, the Strategic Bombing Campaign, and then finally the Northwest Europe Campaign. And each of these campaigns made, I think, material contributions to the eventual defeat of the European Axis. But of, of the five campaigns, the one that is most important is the Maritime Campaign, because it's the campaign that ties everything together. And um, none of the other campaigns would have been remotely possible without success in the maritime realm. Um, the entire catalyst for the Allied war operation, at least for the Western Allies, uh, was, was this Maritime Campaign. In fact, it was the vehicle that allowed the, the alliance to exist. Because without success in the maritime realm, uh, Britain is going to fall. And without Britain, even if the United States gets you know, heavily involved in European conflict, which is a debatable proposition, they're gonna find it exceedingly difficult uh, to wage effective conventional warfare against the European Axis without Britain as a partner. And then they still have to get the resources across the Atlantic in order to do so. So again, that, that implies and requires success in the maritime realm. So given the, um, the fact that Germany was the, the, the critical threat, given the fact that this was the critical overall theater of operations and the absolutely essential role that this maritime play, power played in facilitating the entire Allied war effort. I think it is fair to say that in terms of its relevance, this too was the, uh, the supreme uh, maritime conflict within the Second World War. Now, when people think of the Atlantic campaign, to whatever degree people do think, think here are two iconic images that will often come to mind. Of course, on the left, you have a U-boat, and on the right, you have an image of a convoy. And of course, this donates the, the Battle of the Atlantic or the U-boat struggle. And while I'll be the first one to acknowledge that uh, the Battle of the Atlantic was uh, you know, a major component of this campaign, probably the premier component of the Atlantic campaign, I would submit that if that is all you're looking at, you're, you're missing out on, on other activities that were also going on that also played you know, a great essential role and bringing about the ultimate allied victory. So, you know, I entitled this, this presentation Myths and Underreported Facts. Well, I guess myth number one is that the Battle of the, or the Atlantic Campaign was just about the U-Bart struggle. Yes, it was about this, but it was about uh, many other things as well. For instance, uh, there were dozens of surface engagements that occurred in the Atlantic theater, uh, ranging from diff different uh, groupings of warships, ranging in size from battleships down to uh, mortar torpedo boats. Uh, and during the course of these engagements, the Germans lost two capital ships, three if you want to include the Graf Spee, which was sunk in the South Atlantic, uh, 22 assorted destroyers and torpedo boats, a mine layer, and 17 minesweepers. Uh, as for the British, their losses included a battle cruiser, an aircraft carrier, a light cruiser, and uh, roughly about nine destroyers. So if you are a student of naval surface uh, warfare, um, there were plenty of engagements in the Atlantic theater. There were also a fair amount of carrier operations in the Atlantic theater. Again, when we typically think about aircraft carrier operations during the Second World War, we're inherently going to focus on the Pacific. Uh, but that doesn't take away from the fact that there were also carrier operations within the Atlantic. Much of this centered upon the activities of the escort carriers, uh, such as the picture I have depicted on the left, uh, which carried out a variety of roles, probably the most important of which was to help close the, the uh, mid-Atlantic mid air gap that existed. Um, and, and through their activities, uh, their aircraft sank or participated in the destruction of, of about 55 U-boats during the course of the campaign. So again, this was a major contributor. Uh, but, but the theater also saw operations of, of fleet aircraft carriers. Uh, amongst those was the American aircraft carrier Ranger, uh, 
which in October 1943 conducted uh, or participated in a home fleet operation against a German shipping off Norway that resulted in the destruction of five German merchant ships. Another example would be the aircraft carrier Ark Royal, which played an essential role in helping to sink the German battleship uh, Bismarck. And then there were other British uh, fleet carriers, a total of five, along with escort carriers, carried out a whole series of raids and assaults against uh, German shipping along uh, Norway, uh, which eventually resulted in the destruction of about 24 German vessels. Uh, pictured here on the right is the flight deck of the aircraft carrier HMS Formidable. And when I look at this picture, to me, it looks like something that you would definitely see in the Pacific. But in fact, this picture here was taken off Norway in 1944. And then, of course, there were submarine operations. Now, when we think about submarine operations in the Atlantic, of course, we're naturally going to think about the U-boats. But the fact is that the British and Allies also carried out submarine operations for themselves. Um, and during the course of this campaign, uh, British and Allied submarines sank about 150 German vessels in the waters off Northwest Europe. One highlight of this included the uh, German light cruiser Karlsruhe, which was sunk uh, by the British submarine HMS Truant in April of 1940. Another high point is the activities of the submarine picture here, HMS, HMS Venture, which near the end of the war sank two different U-boats during a period of about three months. And what is noteworthy about this was the destruction of the second U-boat, uh, which was U-864. Uh, at the time of that destruction, both Venture and U-864 were submerged at the time of the attack. So this was the first and only officially acknowledged time in history where one submerged submarine intentionally sank another submerged submarine. And given the technology that existed at the time, the fact that Venture was able to do this was a major uh, accomplishment. And then there were the aerial operations associated with the campaign. I already touched upon the aircraft carriers, but the fact is, is that the vast majority of aerial operations associated with the Atlantic campaign were carried out by shore-based aircraft. This includes the activities of Bomber Command, uh, which during the course of the war through mine lane and attacks against ports was responsible for the destruction of almost 1,100 German vessels in, in, in Northern European waters. Um, it also includes activities of RAF Coastal Command, which added about another 600 vessels that were sunk during the course of the campaign, including about 200 U-boats. A uh, picture on the left is the Avril Lancaster, which was the premier bomber in Bomber Command. And in the last year of the war, Lancaster bombers sank dozens of German uh, warships, including the German battleship Tirpitz, the pre-dreadnought battleship Schleswig-Holstein, and the pocket battleships Admiral Scheer and Lutzow. Pictured on the right is a uh, Bristol Bullfighter, uh, which was the premier strike aircraft in, in, in RAF Coastal Command in direct attack roles against German shipping, uh, generally used in what we'll call striking operations. And whether armed with rockets, bombs, or torpedoes, the bullfighter was the most prolific ship killer uh, in a direct attack role in the Royal Air Force inventory. So I've kind of given an overview now of, of some of the combat that took place within the Atlantic Theater. Now I'm going to delve into you know, what the actual roles were uh, that the, each side was trying to, uh, to exercise with their maritime forces. And for the British, I define maritime forces as this. Uh, you have the Royal Navy, you have the British Merchant Marine, and then you have those components in the Royal Air Force, again, that are supporting this maritime contest. Uh, and of course, that also includes then their Commonwealth uh, uh, counterparts. Uh, and of course, it's a similar type of situation for the Germans. So as far as Britain is concerned, during the course of the Second World War, Britain's maritime services fulfilled five major roles. The first of these was to defend Britain against direct assault, Second was to secure vital seaborne lines of communication. The third was to impose a maritime blockade against Germany. The fourth was to support the needs of the army. And then finally, a final role which was adopted once the war was underway was to provide logistical support to the Soviet Union. As for the Germans, they, they had principally had three major roles for their maritime forces. Uh, first and probably foremost was uh, to conduct an interdiction operation against allied seaborne lines of communication. Secondly, they wanted to secure their own seaborne lines of communication and at least secure a minimum degree of overseas trade. And then third was to support the needs of the German army, which really didn't manifest itself so much in the West, but in the campaigns in the East and the Mediterranean, there were definitely cases where German maritime forces were supporting ground operations. So going forward now, we're gonna talk about each of these roles and get into a little bit greater detail. 
Uh, first role, as I said before, was defending Britain against direct assault. Um, and, and this is a role that's very easy to overlook and it's somewhat hard to measure because to a very large extent, you're measuring a non-event. Uh, but we have to keep in mind that in the summer of 1940, uh, Britain faced a, uh, the greatest challenge to its independence, it's essentially since the Spanish Armada of the 1500s. Um, and part of this was the threat of invasion hung over the, uh, over the nation in the form of Operation Sea Line that the, the Germans proposed to launch. Now, Sea Line, of course, never occurred because the Germans failed to attain the prerequisite air superiority that they felt was necessary in order to launch the invasion. Um, and, and thus, uh, um, credit for saving off this invasion is usually focused on the Royal Air Force and, and their success during the Battle of Britain. And while I, I certainly have nothing negative to say about the exemplary performance of the Royal Air Force in the Battle of Britain, I would nevertheless submit the true deterrent to Germany's invasion in, in the summer of 1940, in fact, was the Royal Navy. Or to be more specific, it was the strength of the Royal Navy compared to the relative weakness of the Kriegsmarine. Now, part of this imbalance was, was exacerbated by events that occurred a couple months prior to this with the uh, invasion of Norway. Uh, Germany, of course, invades Norway in April 1940, and they're successful in their undertaking in that they're able to conquer the country. But in at least one important respect, this is a Pyrrhic victory. And that's related to the heavy losses that the German Kriegsmarine suffered, uh, mostly at the hands of the Royal Navy. These losses include three cruisers, 10 destroyers, two torpedo boats, two fleet mine sweepers, a mine layer, and six U-boats that are sunk, and other vessels that are damaged, including uh, two battle cruisers and a uh, pocket battleship, again, which are damaged and put out of action for several months. The result of this is a few months later, you know, in, in the late summer of 1940, when the, uh, when the Germans are now looking at the prospect of invading Britain, the Kriegsmarine is in no realistic position to be able to carry this out or support this. Um, and so that is one of the reasons why this air security requirement was so absolutely essential because the Germans needed to use the Luftwaffe to compensate for the relative weakness of the Kriegsmarine. And of course, this doesn't materialize and the invasion is never launched. But again, we have to go to the, the core reason why this was so important and what the deterrent was. And that was the strength of the Royal Navy compared to the rel relative weakness of the Kriegsmarine. Now, another thing that I'll also bring up uh, that contributed to Britain's ability to maintain its independence in the summer of, of 1940 was the fact that they were able to, to rescue their, their expeditionary force. Uh, this primarily revolves around the, the evacuation at Dunkirk, Operation Dynamo, which I'm sure everybody here is familiar with. But in fact, there were other evacuations that also took place in, in different other parts of France and in Norway. And as a result of these entire undertakings, the British with Allied support, were able to use their maritime forces to evacuate almost 600,000 Allied personnel. About two-thirds of these evacuated personnel were British, and another third came from other Allied nations. And in the process of doing this, the British saved roughly 85% of their expeditionary force, which provided both a practical and a psychological impetus in their decision to fight on. And one of the things we now know with the hindsight of history is, you know, this, despite the uh, the persona that was, was, was generated at the time, there were very powerful elements within the British government that wanted to capitulate in the summer of 1940, basically wanted to come to an accommodation with Hitler. Uh, and of course, Churchill you know, resisted this, uh, but had the British expeditionary force been destroyed in Europe, the pressure to have capitulated or come to an, a, a negotiated settlement with Hitler would have increased exponentially and whether or not Churchill's government would have survived that pressure, I think is, is a very open question. So again, of course, this doesn't come to fruition. And I think this is another example of how the British use maritime power in an indirect way to defend Britain against direct assault and maintain Britain's independence. Of course, this is also an example of them using maritime power to support the needs of an army. Now, once uh, Britain's immediate survival was attained in the summer of 1940, they were still in a very precarious situation, which brings us to the second role, which is the need to secure vital maritime lines of communication. Uh, this was true because Britain is an island, and then as is now, is not self-sufficient in a variety of different important strategic resources. Amongst those is food. I mean, the British didn't come anywhere close to producing enough food to feed their population. Um, so shortages had to be made up uh, through uh, seaborne import, importation. Now, in 1938, the year before 
tins, uh, the British import a total of uh, 68 million tons into the United Kingdom. And once the war starts, British defense planners realize that they can use this amount, you know, through rationing and through increased domestic production uh, for those uh, items that they're actually able to produce domestically, but they still establish an absolute minimum level of 27 million tons, which is necessary to, to, to support the country's basic needs. And of course, they want to bring in more than this if they actually want to conduct a robust war effort against the European Axis. So it's very critical that they maintain these lines of communication. But I also want to point out that this isn't just a one-way street of materials that need to come in and, and, and sustain Britain. But then again, because they're an island, in order to uh, uh, conduct offensive war against the European access, uh, they're going to have to use similar lines of communication then to deploy forces in places like Africa, Southern Europe, Northwest Europe, in order to uh, engage in, in a robust war effort. So they're these supply lines and logistical uh, maritime lines of communication are both critical to sustain the nation and then to conduct offensive war. Uh, the British go about doing this by instituting a convoy system early on in the war. Basically, the first month of the war, as we'll discuss later, this convoy system was far from complete, uh, but it, it will be improved upon and by the latter half of 1941, it's pretty comprehensive. And this will be the cornerstone of British efforts to basically secure their uh, maritime lines of communication. Uh, and the British have three major uh, assets that are going to assist them in this process. Number one, they start the war with the largest merchant fleet in the world, which weighed in at approximately 18 million tons, is more than twice the size of its next closest competitor, which is the United States, and is about four times the size of the German merchant fleet. They also have the largest Navy in the world, with the United States a very close second, and they have a global inf infrastructure that's in place that again is going to help them support these maritime operations. Now, from the German perspective, uh, the Germans recognized after their failure to subdue Britain in 1940 that the best opportunity to drive Britain out of the war uh, is through a maritime blockade, and essentially to starve the British into submission. So in August 1940, Hitler and the Germans are going to use a variety of weapons to, to enforce this, but of the weapons they're going to use, the primary one is going to be the U-boats. And by the end of 1941, pretty much the entire emphasis on the U-boats, because the rest of these things have pretty much fallen by the wayside. Now, as I said, they're, they're trying to blockade Britain. This isn't a, a direct blockade. Uh, and they don't, Germans don't necessarily like to operate in close proximity to Britain, but what they prefer to do is operate when British forces are weak and the British are stronger around their home islands. So what the Germans are going to do is they're going to target the British and allied merchant fleet with the idea of we're going to sink German, or excuse me, we're going to sink British and allied merchant shipping wherever we can find it uh, with the idea of sinking it faster than it can be replaced. In such a manner, we're going to cause attrition and eventually we're going to trade it down to the point where the British slash allied merchant fleet is no longer capable of supporting these logistical needs. That, that is what they're attempting to do. And in order to do this, they adopt a uh, goal of sinking 700,000 tons of British and allied shipping per month. They feel that if they can do that on a consistent basis, they're going to attain the type of attrition needed to be decisive against the uh, British merchant fleet and eventually have a decisive impact upon British imports. So now I've given you kind of an overview of the conditions and, and what they're trying to accomplish during the what we call the Battle of the Atlantic. Um, now I'm going to go in and, and discuss the Battle of the Atlantic a little more by discussing three myths that are associated with the Battle of the Atlantic. Um, of course, the Germans don't win this battle, uh, or conversely, uh, the British don't lose it. Um, the Germans are able to sink a large number of ships, but they never really sink enough ships to truly be decisive. And myth number one that is associated with the Battle of the Atlantic is that this was a close run thing. Uh, you can definitely find books out there, documentaries, television programs, movies that all seem to imply that Britain was on the brink of collapse. At one point or another, the British were on the brink of collapse. Uh, even the renowned naval historian Stephen Roskill gets a little bit wobbly when he starts talking about the convoy battles in 19, uh, March 1943. Well, the truth is, when you, when you look back at the data uh, dispassionately, uh, you can see that, in fact, the Germans never actually came close to winning this battle. And there's two sets of data that really display this. Uh, this. This middle column that you see here, 
uh, merchant ship that was available to the British Merchant Marine, uh, which again was the target of the, uh, uh, of the German effort, you can see that yes, the Germans were able to sink uh, large quantities of British ships, but the British were able to reforce, uh, replace those losses either through new construction or other means. And all total, uh, the Germans are never able to attain any real degree of protection against the British merchant fleet. In fact, the British merchant fleet expands to the course of the war uh, to the extent that, you know, by the end of the war, there are actually more merchant ships in the British merchant fleet, or more tonnage in the British merchant fleet than there was at the beginning of the war. The Germans failed to cause appreciable uh, attrition against the British merchant fleet, even though they are able to sink, you know, a, a fair number of ships. The other thing to focus on is, is the fourth column, then, which is the United Kingdom, which again is what this is ultimately all about. Um, now, clearly, British imports decline compared to where they were at pre-war levels, but they don't decline, decline enough to truly make a difference. And I'll highlight uh, the 1942, where, which was the, the worst year in the war uh, for the Battle of the Atlantic. Uh, total imports into the United Kingdom amount to just 34 million tons, which is half the pre-war levels that we talked about earlier, but it's still substantially higher than 27 million ton threshold that the British had established for themselves. And this is during the worst year of the war. In other years of the war, um, the British are able to bring in much more, uh, over 40 million tons per year, and in one case, over 50 million tons per year. And this is more than enough to sustain the British society, the British economy, and allow them to conduct a robust war effort. And it also allows the United States to bring its resources across the Atlantic and participate in this contest. So the Germans fail in this effort to, to, uh, to cause appreciable attrition or, or, or to either the British merchant fleet or Britain's import situation. And in the process of doing so, if we look at the last column, we can see that the Germans suffered heavy losses to themselves, which for their U-boat arm included the loss of uh, 1,015 U-boats that are sunk during the war through combat action, accidents, unknown causes, and scuttling. Um, and that's the material loss. When you look at the human losses associated with this, the fatality rates for U-boat crews were exceedingly high. You know, other than maybe kamikazes during the Second World War, about the most dangerous thing you could be in terms of fatality rates was a member of a German U-boat crew. So with all of these things said, uh, you might say, well, if that's the case, then maybe the threat was overblown. And maybe the threat was never that great to begin with. And I would counter that by saying, I think the threat was very real. Uh, and the fact that the Germans never came close to winning this battle is more of a reflection of the effectiveness of the British and Allied response to the threat and a notion that the threat wasn't real. And in order to, to further support this, I'm gonna compare and contrast what happened in the Atlantic with what happened in the Pacific, where in the Pacific, the Americans, with some Commonwealth contribution, but overwhelmingly it's the Americans, are able to do exactly to the Japanese what the Germans are attempting to do to the British. During the course of a little more than three years, the Americans uh, sink uh, roughly 85% of the accumulated Japanese merchant fleet. Of what remains, about two thirds of that is laid up by the end of the war due to battle damage or lack of infrastructure. Japanese seaborne uh, commerce grinds to a halt in the last months of the war. Japanese home islands are essentially cut off from the resources of their empire. Now, the fact that the Americans are able to accomplish this is, in one sense, it's a reflection of American prowess, but I think it's more of a reflection of the ineptitude of the Japanese when it came to defending their lines of communication. Um, now, in the Atlantic theater, by comparison, arguably the Germans make a, a greater effort to impede British lines of communication and the fact that they're unable to do so, again, is a reflection of the effectiveness of the British and Allied response to that threat. All right, myth number two regarding the uh, Battle of the Atlantic is this, this notion that exists in popular culture of convoy after convoy crossing the Atlantic and just being ravaged by U-boats. You know, that it's a shooting gallery, um, you know, a U-boat shooting gallery. Well, the reality is, is that it's certainly true that certain convoys uh, were hard hit during the Battle of the Atlantic, but the vast majority of convoys crossed the Atlantic. Um, and I pointed this out on an online post a few months ago, and I got some pushback on this. I actually had some guy call me a liar. Um, so I shared the data. And I think the data is uh, during the course of the Second World War, a total of 261,000 merchant ships traveled to, from, and around the United Kingdom in, in convoys. 
of those 261,000 ships, the total amount that were sunk is 902. This reflected a loss rate of 0.3%, or basically one third of 1%. During the worst year of the war, which again was 1942, the loss rate for, for convoys crossing the Atlantic was 1.5%, which means that for every uh, 75 vessels that sent out, uh, 74 safely made it to their destinations. So again, while it's certainly true that certain convoys uh, were hard hit, uh, this was the rare exception. And what was the norm is most convoys crossed the Atlantic uh, unscathed. And on those convoys that did suffer losses, the vast majority of those were minor losses, which is a great uh, testament to the effectiveness of the Allied convoy system. But again, and, and, and the data shows this, but again, there's this mythology that exists out there that is just kind of ingrained in, in some of the popular culture. All right, the third um, myth regarding the Battle of the Atlantic is what constituted the true turning point of this battle? Now, traditional history says that the turning point of the Battle of the Atlantic was May 1943, when the Allies demonstrated their ascendancy over the U-boats. And I would be the first one to agree that the Allies did demonstrate their ascendancy in May 1943. But I don't think this was the true turning point of this contest. Actually, the true turning point of the Battle of the Atlantic And the reason I say that is because if the Germans ever were going to win the Battle of the Atlantic, it would have been in 1941. They started the year out on a high note uh, in the middle of their first happy time. And in the first six months of that year, uh, total Allied shipping losses amount to 2.9 million tons of shipping, uh, mostly in the Atlantic. A little bit of it is in the Mediterranean, but overwhelmingly mostly in the Atlantic. Uh, and at the end of this period, British defense planners uh, looking at the trends and they're projecting that these trends continue, uh, they're projecting a loss of a total of 7 million tons by the end of the year. Uh, and they're contemplating the impact this is going to have on Britain's um, merchant fleet and on Britain's import situation. And even then, we're still not talking crisis, but obviously we're talking about a very dark uh, future that they're looking at. But fortunately for them, things are already in the works that are going to turn this around. Uh, and this is really a transitional point. And there are a number of things that, that, that help facilitate this. And I can't really get into all of them just for you know, time's sake, but I'm gonna touch upon the two that I think are most critical. Number one is that the convoys are just better defended. And part of that just revolves around the fact that there are more escorts now available. And I'm going to give you, a, 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 and, and this of course is a result of production out of shipyards, as well as the destroyers uh, for bases deal and other things. But the British simply have more escorts available. And I'm going to give you two snapshots now that hopefully are going to, to demonstrate this uh, quite well. Um, these are just snapshots in time, but again, I think they can be a very important uh, example. Um, first, we're going to go back a year prior to this, the 1st of July, 1940. And on that specific day, uh, the total number of escorts that were at sea supporting 16 different convoys was nine. So the British have nine escorts supporting 16 convoys, and you're probably scratching your head thinking, well, how does that work? Well, the way it worked is because the convoys spent most of the time crossing the Atlantic unescorted. And it was only when they are in the vicinity of Britain that they received their escort, and then it was only in the form of usually one destroyer or sloop. So for most of their passage, uh, they were unescorted, at least when it came to anti-submarine coverage. They may have like a surface, uh, a, a merchant cruiser in, in um with them, but you know that was pretty much useless against uh, submarines. So when it came to submarine coverage, they only really got protection once they were in the vicinity of Britain. Now we move ahead a year and we're, we're in the 1st of July, 1941. The total number of escorts available are at sea on that specific date, 65. So we have more than a seven fold increase in the number of escorts that are at sea. So they're just simply more escorts available and then on top of this, the British now have access to additional bases, uh, which primarily I'm focusing on are Iceland and St. John's, Newfoundland. So with a combination of both of these, these additional escorts and the bases that are available, uh, the British are finally able to provide continuous coverage for the convoys crossing the Atlantic. Um, the first of these convoys will actually sail at the end of May. Over the next few months, it'll be expanded outwards to the point that by the end of the summer, all convoys traveling into and out of Britain have continuous coverage during the course of their, their transits. So that's a major factor. The other major factor is also 
Um, the British are able to break the German home waters key, uh, which is the primary key that they use to communicate with their U-boats at this time uh, and their Enigma machines. And by breaking this key for the latter half of the year, the British are able to read you know, the vast majority of messages sent to and from the U-boats uh, with a minimum of time delay. And of course, this allows the British to, to draw up a very good understanding of where the U-boats are and what their dispositions are. And as a result of this, of course, they have the ability then to route the convoys around the U-boat concentrations and or reinforce uh, threatened convoys. And there will be periods of time for days or weeks where the Germans are basically searching empty ocean. They can't find anything. And the reason they can't find anything is because the British know the U-boats are located and they're simply routing around them. So the results of all of these things is during the, the second half of 1941, uh, losses are cut in half. Um, and total losses for that six month period amount to 1.4 million tons. And this includes again, uh, operations in the Mediterranean and now the new Pacific war that has just started. Uh, so losses for the year altogether amount to 4.3 million tons, still a sizable amount of tonnage that is sunk, but it's a far cry from the 7 million tons that British defense planners had projected would be lost. And at the same time, U-boat losses are creeping upwards to the point that in December 1941, uh, the U-boats lose a total of 10 of their number with the highest uh, monthly loss rate up to that point in the war. And probably most importantly, what happens in December 1941 is the United States comes into the conflict. And once this happens, any chances the Germans ever had of winning the Battle of the Atlantic basically evaporate. Uh, because immediately when the United States comes into the war, it brings in it with it its own merchant fleet, which at the time consists of about 10 million tons of shipping, which is now part of the combined Allied shipping pool and more than makes up for the losses the Allies have suffered up to this point in the war. But the other thing, which is actually probably more important in the long run, is America's immense shipbuilding capacity. Uh, which will take about a year to get fully mobilized. But once this is mobilized, the Americans can be at the point where they will be producing a million tons of shipping per month. And they're producing ships much faster than the Germans could ever hope to sink them. Um, so like I said, you know, Germany's prospect of being successful in the tonnage campaign dies when America comes into the war. Now, to be sure, um, 1942 is going to be a tough year for the Allies. Altogether, the Allies are going to lose 7.8 million tons of shipping globally. Uh, this includes about 3.1 million tons that are sunk off America's eastern seaboard uh, during Operation Drumbeat, uh, roughly 40% of those losses. But you have to compare these losses against output from, from American and to a lesser extent uh, British shipyards, which produce 6.7 million tons of shipping during the same period. So the actual net loss is only 1.1 million tons. And this is against the combined shipping pool now that's over 30 million tons strong. So on the surface in 1942, it kind of appears that the Germans are making progress, but when you delve into it, they're really not. And then by the time you roll into 1943, it's done. Um, because by that time, again, the Americans are producing a million tons of shipping per month. By the time you roll around to May 1943, the traditional view of turning point, the Germans are at the point where they, they don't have to sink 700,000 tons anymore. They have to sink 1.3 million tons in order to make any type of attrition against the Allied merchant fleet. And they're not sinking anywhere close to this. On good months, they're sinking maybe half this number. And on most months, it's about a quarter of this number. But by the time you roll into what is considered the turning point in the Battle of the Atlantic, uh, the Germans are waging a, a battle that they can't win. Um, and, and this is really actually the end result uh, of a set of events that actually was set into place about two years before. So I would argue again that the real turning point in this campaign was two years before the, the summer of 1941. So we kind of talked about the Battle of the Atlantic and this of course was you know, the most important aspect of the, the whole campaign that's underway within the Atlantic theater. But again, it's not the only thing that's going on. Um, Concurrently, throughout this entire period, this entire defensive struggle that's underway, the British are conducting a, a concurrent offensive struggle against the, uh, the Germans, to which the British are trying to do exactly what the Germans are trying to do the British, which is to destroy the German merchant fleet and deprive them of overseas trade. Now, of course, Germany is a continental nation and as such was not as dependent upon overseas trade as was with Britain, but is still derived benefit from overseas trade. Uh, in 1939, again, the, the year the war started, total overseas imports into uh, Germany amounted to 29 million tons. And the Germans realized they're going to lose some of this because the British are going to be able to 
deny them general access to the greater oceans. But at a minimum, the Germans want to maintain their, their Baltic trade with Scandinavia because the Germans uh, receive a number of important resources from Scandinavia, the most important of which is phosphorus rich iron ore that comes from Sweden and Norway. This iron ore is a major component in the German steel making industry, particularly in the rural area. And the Germans uh, and, and the British recognize that this is a, a critical element in the German economy and the Ger German uh, war making apparatus. Uh, in 1939, total iron ore imports into, into Germany from Scandinavia amount to 11.1 million tons. So roughly about 35, 36% of the overall German imports are just this iron ore. And the Germans want to maintain this. Now, in addition to that, as I said before, they recognize that they can generally lose access to the greater oceans, but they also institute a blockade runner program so they can at least bring in minimum quantities of different strategic resources such as natural rubber. So that's what they're going to try and pursue. And of course, the British are going to try and deny them uh, these ac access. And as I, uh, as I kind of alluded to earlier, uh, the British right away are, are generally able to cut Germany off from its general global trade. Um, and at the time the war starts in 1939 and then later in 1940, when Italy comes into war, both the German and the uh, Italian merchant fleets have sizable numbers of merchant ships that are caught in, you know, overseas. Uh, over 2 million tons worth of shipping is caught overseas. And of this, about 1.6 million tons will eventually be sunk or seized by the Allies. Um, but well, the, the British are, are generally successful at denying the Germans access to the greater oceans. But as far as this Baltic trade is concerned, that's a different animal because the British don't have direct, assault, uh, direct access to the Baltic just due to geographical reasons. So the British themselves are going to adopt a tonnage strategy the goal of which, again, is to attack the German merchant fleet and those vessels available to the Germans to utilize, sink them wherever they can find them with the idea of if we sink enough of them, this will degrade uh, this Baltic trade and eventually hopefully bring it to the point where it'll be, uh, it'll collapse. Uh, and the British use a number of different weapons to enforce this blockade, including mines, both aerial and, and maritime laid mines, uh, of which the, 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 the vast bulk, like 90% are laid by aircraft. Uh, aircraft, which are used in a, a bombing raids against ports and direct attacks at sea, surface warships, submarines, and also diplomatic pressure, which uh, will become very effective towards the end of the war against some of the Scandinavian countries. And together through these opportunities, the British are, are essentially, you know, fairly successful in carrying out uh, their, their, their objectives. Uh, unfortunately, part of my, my screen here is cut off, but during the course of the European conflict, beyond the 1.6 million tons that I already discussed was, was lost uh, overseas, within European waters itself, outside of the Mediterranean and, um, and Black Sea, uh, the Axis loses a total of 4.4 million tons of merchant shipping. This constitutes about 80% of the merchant ships that are available to the Germans uh, in Northwest Europe, uh, or Northern European waters. Um, and of course, at the end of the, the, the war, what's left of the Germans, again, a, a sizable portion of that is non-operational due to battle damage or, again, just infrastructure reasons. Um, so for all intents and purposes, the, the British have been able to do to the German merchant fleet essentially what the Americans do to the Japanese. Um, now, what impact does this have on trade? Well, we'll start first upon the blockade runner program. Uh, the Germans execute their blockade runner program. It, it fits and starts throughout the war. Uh, it generally suffers heavy losses. Uh, generally, um, you know, only about 50% of the, uh, the materials that are dispatched, if, if that much, are able to actually make it to Europe. And eventually by 1943, excuse me, the beginning of 1944, the Germans suspend the blockade runner program altogether due to the heavy losses. Um, now, in fairness, they will continue to operate, you know, some minor operations with submarines, but this is just a drop in the bucket. And for all intents and purposes, the blockade runner program is suspended in 1944. Now, what about the all-important uh, Baltic Scandinavian trade? Uh, well, this sees a uh, progressive decline during the course of the war. Uh, by 1942, iron ore imports are down 23% compared to the war, their, their pre-war levels. By 1944, they're down by more than half. And by 1945, they collapse altogether. Uh, to the extent that in the first four months of 1945, the rate of iron ore imports is only 2.7% of its pre-war levels. So 97.3% of this trade has been interdicted. What impact this has on the German economy, that's, that's very hard to directly measure. 
But one thing we can look at is raw, raw uh, crude steel production, which again was very much tied to these iron ore imports. And you can see from the numbers I've got posted here that there is a, con a corresponding decline that is taking place in this, this steel output. Now, I'm not suggesting there's a one-for-one -one correlation here because I recognize there are other factors that were also in play. But I think this was a contributing factor and German industrialists after the war confirmed that. Now, another benefit this blockade provides though is it forces the Germans to divert sizable resources into defensive applications. Uh, the Germans are, are, are serious about trying to defend these maritime lines of communication. And that's demonstrated by the efforts they, they put about to do that. That includes the deployment of hundreds uh, of batteries, gun batteries that are deployed all along the coastline, stretching from border with Spain up through Norway. Uh, hundreds of batteries, mostly anti-aircraft batteries, anti-shipping batteries, um, the entire length of that coastline. Uh, another example of this, of course, is the Greek Marine, which has a sizable number of ships to defensive applications. And again, I'm going to share a snapshot. This is April 1944. The total number of ships employed in defensive applications for the Greek Marine was 2,343. And again, you can see the breakdown of, of of the different vessels that were utilized within that number. Uh, to put this in context, context uh, this is over five times the number of commissioned U-boats the Germans had available to them on this day. Now, in fairness, you know, most of these are auxiliaries or minor vessels, but still gives an idea of some of the resources the Germans are putting forth to defend their maritime lines of communication. In terms of personnel, they're employing hundreds of thousands of, of men. Um, and just two examples of this is over 200,000 men are used to man these, these vessels, uh, man anti-aircraft guns that are placed upon merchant ships and to support these operations. And another 115,000 naval personnel are assigned to the, the naval ashore batteries that again, they're positioned along the, the Atlantic coastline. So, um, so the fourth role that I mentioned before was supporting the needs of the and the, the British and allies use maritime power in a variety of ways in order to be able to do this. Uh, I'm only gonna to touch upon three here. The first of these is logistical support, which in my mind is absolutely the most important of, of the different things that the maritime power can do to support ground operations. Uh, if you're Germany or Russia, you can, you can, you can uh, conduct major ground operations utilizing ground lines of communication. If you're Britain or the United States and you wanna operate uh, in, in Africa or Southern Europe or Northwest Europe, you have to depend upon maritime lines of communication in order to do that. Uh, you have to get your forces to the, uh, the theaters of battle, and then you have to logistically support them, which is a tremendous undertaking because literally everything a modern army uses from bullets to beans and tanks to gasoline has to come in by sea. And this is a tremendous undertaking. I'm gonna give you two snapshots of, of just the degree of what we're talking about. The first of these was the uh, Normandy campaign, which takes place from the 6th of June, 1940, uh, 1944 through the end of August. And during that time frame, Allied maritime forces are able to land over 2 million men, almost 450,000 vehicles, and over 3 million tons of supplies to support this undertaking. Uh, obviously a huge effort, but this pales in comparison to what will follow a, a few months later. Uh, during the execution of the Northwest Europe campaign, uh, when it, at the end of this campaign, the Allies have over 4 million men now employed uh, in, in combat operations in Northwest Europe. In order to logistically support this in the last full month of, of that campaign, which is April 1945, Allies delivered three, almost 3.5 million tons of supplies uh, to Northwest Europe. Now, to put this in context, a few months ago, gave a presentation about the contest in the Mediterranean, um, during which time the 1941-1942 timeframe, the Italians are attempting to support Axis uh, ground forces in North Africa, and the Italians are bringing uh, resources across the uh, Mediterranean. And on, on most months, the Italians are probably bringing across, on average, about 70 to 80,000 tons of supplies. Some months less, some months more, but on average, 70 to 80,000 tons. The effort that the Allies execute in April 1945 is over 40 times larger than this Italian effort in the Mediterranean. And we have to remember that this is just one effort that's uh, of an ongoing war effort that's going on globally. Because in addition to Northwest Europe, the Allies are also supporting major ground operations in Southern Europe, in Burma, and all across the Pacific. And all of these 
uh, require these logistical maritime lines of communications to support them. Uh, in some cases, both Britain and the United States are supporting lines of communication that literally stretch across the world. And the fact that both Britain and the United States have the maritime power in order to be able to carry this out is, is just a, a, a tremendous testimony to the, that, that maritime power that uh, allows them to do that. A second uh, contribution that the uh, maritime forces uh, make in supporting the needs of the Army is the execution of amphibious landings. Now, in the European contest, the Allies are going to execute a whole series of amphibious landings in the Mediterranean, from North Africa to Sicily to Italy to southern France. In the Atlantic and, and Northwest uh, European area, uh, the one major uh, landing that takes place, of course, is the Normandy landing. Uh, you know, Operation Overlord, or the maritime component of which was referred to as Operation Neptune. Uh, this was the granddaddy of all amphibious landings, uh, largest amphibious landing in history, uh, involving about 7,000 vessels. And at least from a, a maritime point of view, it was predominantly a British-run affair. Um, and one example of that is the fact that 79% of the warships and roughly 60% of the landing vessels that were utilized uh, during Operation Neptune and, and the Normandy campaign came from British or, or, or Commonwealth sources. So through the successful execution of this landing and the subsequent logistical efforts that I previously described, this allowed the Allied armies then to conduct the Northwest Europe campaign, which ultimately resulted in the conquest of Germany and the destruction of the German army. But again, this was entirely dependent upon maritime support in order to make this happen. The final thing I'm going to touch upon as far as contributions to supporting the needs of the army is naval gunfire support. Uh, during the course of the European War, British and Allied ships conducted literally thousands of fire support missions, during which time they fired hundreds of thousands of shells in support of Allied ground forces. Uh, one snapshot of this is the battle, again, uh, the Normandy campaign. Uh, during a three-month period, British battleships, cruisers, and monitors conducted over 740 uh, fire missions, during which time they expended almost 35,000 high-caliber shells. British destroyers during the same period added another 24,000 shells. Um, this naval gunfire could be, it was, a, it was definitely a, a force multiplier for the Allied ground forces. And it's, it's something that the Germans had no counter or equivalent to. Um, and there were times during the war, predominantly in the Mediterranean, where this naval gunfire support, in fact, was decisive in helping turn battles into the Allied favor. Now, the final rule that we're going to talk about is providing logistical support to the Soviet Union. Again, this role was adopted once the war was underway. Altogether, during the course of the war, the Allies provided the Soviet Union with about 16.5 million tons of, of supplies and resources. And these came through various routes, including across the Pacific and through the Persian Gulf area. But the most direct route, and the one that was closest to the end users, was the Arctic route to Romansk and Archangel. Uh, this was the most direct, but it was also the most dangerous, in that the forces involved had to literally sail through a gauntlet of U-boats, aircraft, and German surface warships along a very restricted route uh, while dealing with some of the worst climatic conditions in the world. But despite these hardships, the British, again with, with Allied support, eventually conducted a total of 75 convoys to and from the Soviet Union over a four-year period. Uh, these convoys, in addition to a handful of ships that sailed independently, eventually involved uh, 1,567 merchant ships, of which 1,432 successfully arrived at their destinations. Of those ships that didn't arrive, a handful turned back, but a full 100 were sunk, uh, thus representing a loss rate of 6.4% for the convoys involved. Now, again, uh, this was obviously a substantially higher loss rate than what was going on in the Atlantic convoys that we discussed earlier. Uh, beyond the merchant shipping losses, the navies involved also, also suffered heavy losses. Uh, for the British and allies, this included the loss of two cruisers, six destroyers, ten assorted uh, escorts and minesweepers, and a submarine. For the Germans, this included a battle cruiser, three destroyers, and 38 U-boats. So heavy losses on both sides. The net result of the whole undertaking is eventually the allies uh, shipped almost four million tons of shipping via this, this Arctic route to the Soviet Union of which 93% arrived. And together this, plus the other tonnage which was arriving through these other routes, you know, played an important role in helping sustain the Soviet war effort on the Eastern Front. So I've described you know, these, these five roles and, 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 and
you know, how they contributed to the Allied victory. But in retrospect, as I'm looking at the contest, in my mind, there was at least one, a, a, a sixth contribution that the Allied maritime power played in, in the defeat of Germany. And that was, it constituted another front in the war for the Germans. Now, traditional wisdom says that when Germany failed uh, to subdue Britain in 1940, and then turned around in 1941 and invaded the Soviet Union, the Germans were thus forced to, to wage a, a two-front war. I would, I would argue that that's understating reality. In fact, the Germans were forced to wage a five-front war. Those fronts being the Eastern Front against the Soviet Union, and then the other four allies, which included the, the, the Western Front, which was Northwest Europe, the Southern Front, which was the activities in Africa, the Mediterranean, and Southern Europe, the Aerial Front, which primarily consisted of their efforts to, to, to confront the Allied strategic bombing campaign, and then finally the Maritime Front. And I'm the only person that I know of, I'm not saying that the other people maybe haven't come to a similar conclusion, but I'm the only person that I know of has actually defined this as a front in the war for the Germans. But I think it's, it's a realistic thing to do when you consider the amount of effort and resources that the Germans put into waging maritime war against the Western allies. And we have to understand that this, this, this effort was overwhelmingly focused against the Western allies. Yes, there was some naval activity in support of, of operations against the Soviets, but the vast bulk of German uh, naval operations were oriented against the Western allies. What, what about these resources? Well. Uh, from 1941 to 1944, uh, approximately 10% of all German armaments production was oriented towards naval applications. Most of this was in the form of shipbuilding. Uh, to put this in perspective, uh, these naval applications took up a, a greater portion of, of German armaments production than did tank production. Um, in the process of doing this, the Germans built a very sizable fleet. I mean, I think when people think about Germany during World War II, they're, they're, they're obviously viewed as a great land power, but I'm not necessarily sure that we consider Germany to be a great naval power. The fact is they built a very sizable Navy. Uh, if, by my estimations and my calculations, they, they at one point or another accumulated a total of 1,640 principal warships that I split out into 12 different categories. Now in fairness, about three quarters of these were U-boats, but this also includes about 450 surface warships uh, ranging from battleships down to fleet minesweepers. Um, and to put this in context, if you're comparing, you know, total numbers uh, of ships in these 12 categories, this was twice the size of the Imperial Japanese Navy during World War II. Now, in terms of displacement tonnage, the Imperial Japanese Navy may very well have been larger. I've never bothered to calculate it, but just ter in terms of numbers of hulls, the German Kriegsmarine was twice the size of the Imperial Japanese Navy. Um, and the point here isn't to compare the Germans to the Japanese. The point is, again, to just demonstrate the amount of resources that the Germans put into this naval contest, again, which was oriented towards the West, because quite frankly, U-boats don't really have that big of an impact in the Battle of Stalingrad or around Moscow or Kursk, uh, but they can have an impact against the Western allies. Uh, as far as manpower is concerned, over 2 million men were employed in this maritime contest. That includes the, the members of the German Kriegsmarine, the German merchant fleet, and industrial workers that were assigned to do this, this work that was oriented towards naval applications. The point of this all is that if the Germans don't have to wage this maritime campaign, they're able to divert a sizable portion of these resources into ground applications that they can maybe use against the Soviets. Um, among other things, depending upon how they want to do this, they can probably double German tank production. Um, they can easily, I can easily see where, again, they can easily deploy at least another dozen divisions against the Soviets and probably twice that or, or more, uh, depending upon how they want to use these resources. But the fact that they're putting so much effort into this maritime contest, I think, again, in my mind, constitutes a front in the war for them and it's just a, another way to measure the value of the maritime war in the West and the value of the contribution that the Western allies made in helping bring about the ultimate defeat of the European access. All right, I'm almost near the end of my presentation. Uh, for most of the time I've been talking uh, much about this conversation in the realm of, of Britain's uh, participation and, and their, 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 their portion of the operations in these different things. And that makes sense because number one, 
in the Atlantic and Northwest Europe, but it also makes sense from just the, the standpoint that Britain was the dominant player in the Atlantic. Just as America was the dominant player in the Pacific, Britain was the dominant player in the United. But that doesn't mean that other allied nations didn't make substantial contributions because of course they did. And I'm gonna highlight two of those. The first is the United States. Um, as far as operational contributions, uh, the United States assumed responsibility for the all important middle convoy routes, middle Atlantic convoy routes that essentially ran from the Americas to the Mediterranean area. So while the British and Canadians were securing the North Atlantic convoy routes, the Americans were responsible for these middle Atlantic convoy routes. Um, and during the course of the war, uh, most of the German U-boats that were sunk um, at, while they were at sea were sunk by the British, at least solely or partially. Uh, but a fair number of, of U-boats were also sunk by the Americans. And there will be periods in the war, like in the summer of 1943, when after you know, the May time frame, when the Germans have moved their forces out of the North Atlantic, they're going to move them to the areas where the Americans are prevalent, and the Americans will be sinking more, more U-boats during this period than what the British are. Um, and, the, and the Americans aren't content on, on, on being defensive in this process, but they will wage offensive operations against the U-boats, which primarily built around hunter-killer groups, the center on escort carriers, and utilizing uh, ultra intelligence and high frequency direction finding, the Americans are aggressively hunting the U-boats uh, with some success during this period of time. Um, now a final uh, component that I will just touch upon as far as these operational contributions are made is the contribution that the U.S. Army Air Force made, uh, which again was also an important player. I touched earlier about the contributions that Bomber Command made, but the truth is, is the American 8th Air Force will also carry out multiple raids against German ports and shipyards, during which time uh, they will sink large numbers of German vessels, including U-boats um, in, in the waters and, and ports off Northwest Europe. So America makes great contributions. Uh, but in my mind, the greatest contribution the Americans make still is in terms of its industrial power. Uh, and just the tremendous amount of output that comes out of American shipyards in terms of not just merchant ships, but also warships and, and every other type of weapon. America truly does become the arsenal of democracy. And in fairness, you know, a sizable portion of, of the vessels and equipment that the British are using uh, to conduct this campaign are American built. Um, so I think in my mind, this is America's most important contribution to this, this campaign is its industrial output. I'm also gonna to touch upon Canada. I generally roll Canada's contribution in with the greater British effort, which I think is reasonable to do. Because you have to remember the world is a very different place 80 some odd years ago. Uh, when Britain entered the war, it didn't do so as the United Kingdom, but rather it entered the war as the head of a, a global empire and commonwealth. Um, and when you look at the, the conduct of the war, uh, there was considerable commonwealth contribution to this contest not just Canada, but Australia, New Zealand, South Africa. Um, and in almost all of these cases, uh, these forces didn't operate independently, but rather their, their operations were rolled into the greater British war effort, whether or not it was on the ground, in the air, or at sea. So again, I tend to look at Canada's contribution as just part of this overall greater British war effort. With that said, I know that uh, many of our Canadian friends are very proud of the role that they played during the Battle of the Atlantic. So I want to highlight just some of those contributions. Uh, first, uh, the Royal Canadian Navy had a major expansion during the course of the war. It started the war with 11 uh, combatant vessels, and by the end of the war, they had over 300 principal warships. Um, the Canadians were generally responsible for the westernmost portions of those all-important North Atlantic convoy routes that I described earlier. Um, and uh, during the course of the war, Canadian warships sank or participated in the destruction of 31 U-boats and 42 enemy surface vessels. Uh, most of this, almost all of this was sunk in the Atlantic. A few of these vessels were sunk in the Mediterranean, but the vast bulk was sunk in the, sunk in the Atlantic. And then finally, a large number of Royal Canadian Air Force squadrons participated in both Bomber Command and Coastal Command, which as I indicated earlier, made major contributions to this maritime effort. So um, again, a, a few shout outs to the contributions that Canada made uh, to this contest. Which brings me to my conclusion. I started the, uh, the presentation uh, reading a little passage, and now I'm going to end it in a similar way, um, because I think it's a fitting way to do so. Uh, 
this passage that I'm, I'm writing is kind of an amalgamation between two different things. A couple months ago, I participated in an online debate, which the question of which was, uh, could the Soviet Union have defeated Germany by itself? So much of this comes from that. Plus, um, I, I also sent a little a blurb to my publisher regarding the, the idea of unsung heroes in history. And I believe this is a good way to, to you know, uh, tie in and, and finish my presentation uh, that I've given. So please bear with me. My passage. Uh, without victory in the Atlantic, there would have been no Western alliance or Western war effort. And the Soviet Union would have faced the full brunt of the European axis alone. Whether the Soviets could have survived under these conditions is a matter of conjecture, but even if they could, it would have almost certainly increased the duration of the war and greatly added to the likelihood of nuclear weapons being used in Europe. Fortunately, this did not happen, and the Western allies were able to make immense contributions to the defeat of Germany. It was the West that primarily destroyed German air power. It was the West that almost exclusively destroyed German naval power. It was the West that conducted the strategic bombing campaign that impeded German industry and forced the Germans to switch substantial resources to defensive applications. It was the West that strangled the German oil industry, thus depriving German forces of vital fuel. It was the West that drove Italy out of the war. It was the West that forced Germany into a multi-front conflict. It was the West that provided substantial material resources to the Soviet Union. Finally, it was the West that conquered most of Germany itself and destroyed a sizable portion of the German army. None of these contributions would have been remotely possible without maritime victory. In the end, the eventual victory over Germany was gained in the plains of Northern Europe with the defeat of the German army in the conquest of their homeland. In much the same light, the defeat of Italy was largely fashioned in the sands and mountains of North Africa. Still, without taking anything away from the ground forces involved, it was sea power, and particularly British sea power, that provided the essential foundation for each of these victories. Thus, given the stakes involved and, and the predominant role that British maritime power played in this vital contest, I think it is reasonable to state that in terms of Britain's long and illustrious maritime heritage, the Second World War truly represented its finest hour. That concludes my presentation. I appreciate uh, your listening. Thank you very much, Brian. I think that was a very interesting presentation. If you can go ahead and uh, close your screen, we can we can um, go to a, a full view of people. For people who have questions, um, I invite you to ask Brian whatever you wish. You can go ahead and unmute yourself when you're asking a question. I, I have a couple questions myself, but I, I will defer to um, whoever wants to um, go first. You can raise your hand or you can... Hal, go ahead and unmute and talk. Yeah, is, uh, is the Battle of the Atlantic seen in the same way in Britain as it is in the US? I mean, in the US, of course, it's, it's the duel, but with, with the U-boats, but uh, in even a lot of historiography, um, tremendous, tremendous naval aspects of the war are downgraded uh, or just or ignored or just not paid attention to. And I was thinking about this recently as to why, why in American naval historical circles, I mean, there's such the focus on the Pacific. And, and of course, in the Pacific, the quick answer is, well, the Americans see navies as fighting navies and they're fighting a navy in the Pacific, whereas in the Atlantic, they're uh, sort of fighting a navy and of course I think your research illustrates now the British and the Americans are really fighting a navy but it's just not seen that way in the U.S. and I'm wondering if it's seen that way in Britain I mean is, is the Battle of the Atlantic, the, the Atlantic really 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 central whereas it's not seen that way in the U.S. Well, well obviously I, I live in Minnesota so I'm not necessarily uh, qualified to talk about how uh, our British friends you know see this battle I think maybe Evan can jump into that but one thing I will add in there is that I think one of the reasons why it, it, it's, I, I, I mean, the Pacific conflict certainly seems to be a, a sexier conflict, a conflict, if you want to put it that way. I mean, the Battle of the Atlantic is really all about statistics. I mean, and it, it's really what it's about, you know, uh, how many uh, convoys are dispatched, how many ships get through, how much merchant tonnage gets through, how many U-boats are sunk, it's statistics. It's month after month after month of these convoys trying to cross the Atlantic. You don't really have that many delineating 
activities like you have the Battle of Midway or the landings at Guadalcanal or whatever the case may be. But, but because you're dealing with that, that doesn't mean that this isn't absolutely essentially and critical to the entire Allied war effort. So um, it, it, that may be part of an explanation as to why this campaign doesn't get the type of respect, at least on this side of the pond, that maybe it should. And of course, I think another thing is the fact, as I said before, this is not an American dominant theater. It's a British dominant theater. And I think that's another factor as well. Uh, Evan, if you might want to interject, uh, you know, uh, from your perspective. Yeah, um, I, 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 first of all, can I say that I, I agreed with almost everything you said. I mean, everything you said I thought was, was basically, basically uh, dead on. Uh, it was fine. Um, on this question of how the British see the Battle of the Atlantic, um, well, certainly from, the, from a Royal Navy point of view, uh, it's, this, it's the most important aspect of the war. I think in terms of the general you know, national perception of, of it, uh, I, I, in some ways, the Royal Navy has always been the silent service. So, I th and, 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 and it's kind of hard for people to grasp the importance of a, a long slog like the Battle of the Atlantic and trade figures and so on. And so people can, I think people can grasp ultra and they can, they can grasp the importance of the, uh, the anti-U-boat war and the role of um, radio intelligence and so on. But I think they have a, they, they might have a better view of, of, uh, of the Navy than they do. And I think partly it's kind of being in the shadow of the RAF too, that the, you know, the, the Royal Air Force has, a, uh, has a, a, a large part, I think, in the, in the British national perception of, of the war. And then D-Day as well, I think would be another element. So I think, I think probably the, the, the population, you know, the, the popular view is probably not as strong as it, as it, as it might be. Can I say one other thing while I'm talking about, about, about your talk, which I agreed with, and that is the kind of, in, in, in strategic terms, and that is the invasion, anti-invasion side of things. You know, the fact that the, uh, I mean, you didn't talk about torch, for example, but I think torch is in some ways um, as significant um, as any other major landing. It's, it is, and it is genuinely transatlantic rather than across the channel. Um, but I, I, think, I think the ability to, uh, to, to project power uh, across the Atlantic is extremely important. And uh, on, on the other side, it's the German inability, the, the failure of German anti-invasion forces uh, to uh, both, both the, 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 the Air Force and the, and the German Navy to do anything about it, which, which I think is, is important, as, as well as the role. I mean, you're, you're entirely right about the, the role of, uh, of, of, the, um, of, of moving troops overseas and, and logistics and so on. But the actual, the actual invasion thing, I think, um, and, and the failure of, of, of German anti-invasion efforts is, uh, is uh, uh, an important way of seeing it as well. I would agree with that, Evan. You, you actually stole one of my comments there at the very end. So <laughs> I, I'm curious, um, Brian, what you consider to be the greatest maritime failure in the Atlantic campaign by the British? Well, um, let, let's see, the greatest maritime failure. I think one of the, the, the I know one of the, um, um, criticisms that Churchill often gets is that uh, the British didn't, they, they didn't orient enough long-range aircraft to the Atlantic campaign. Um, they were focused on the strategic bombing campaign. Um, and obviously they did orient uh, some uh, long-range aircraft. I'm saying you can't say they didn't orient any, but they could have oriented more. Uh, in 1942 timeframe, I mean, the British bombing campaign against Germany was really kind of a waste of time. And maybe they'd have been better off putting some of those assets um, into the Battle of the Atlantic. Now, at the end of the day, we'd still end up in the same place, but I think we just would have ended up, with, you know, sooner uh, with with the Allies attaining their ascendancy over, over the the uh, the U-boats. Um, and I'm I'm not necessarily a critic of the strategic bombing. I, I believe by the end of the war, it actually made a victory. But in 1941, 1942, yeah, it was pretty much they were bombing. You know, they were lucky if they were able to hit a city. Uh, so I, that, that's an example of, of something. they put more of those assets towards the Battle of the Atlantic. They might have defeated the U-boats, you know, yeah, I, you know, who knows, five, six months earlier. You're still going to get the same outcome, though, I, I believe. Okay. 
Well, thank you. Um, I see hands are up, but Sam, is, is, does that mean you want to ask a question? Well, thanks. Um, I, I really have a comment uh, rather than a question, and maybe this will spark some more questions. Um, and first for, for Evan, the anti-invasion, invasion, that's what we've always tried to capture under the term access and anti-access. And, and this whole thing about A2AD, when you get down to the, the theory of it, access to the opponent's theater so you could operate the land forces, which is, you know, or denying access to it. And so so that's a, a good term to use on the invasion and anti-invasion. But to Brian, you have done an outstanding job with this presentation. And the one thing I want to emphasize may be the conclusion that other people don't see. And let's let's put this in context. Um, as some of you know, my work is on current and future strategy. I don't really consider myself a historian per se. I'm a user of history. That is, my belief is that the future is history continued. And that history is our only real laboratory for war. And what you have said, pointed out in this is that it was the ability of the allies to reproduce their shipping, to, to produce their ships, their shipping, and replace their losses that was the key to this victory. And I, I just a thought for those people who look, look towards the future, those who are looking at a potential of a maritime war between the US and China, or that sort of scenario, which we all hopefully will avoid, but people talk about that. The one thing that's very rarely discussed is the replacement of losses. And the, the vision of the technology determinists and others are that, you know, this is going to be a quick war, we're going to trade, and then we're going to trade uh, missiles, and then it's going to conclude. War, as you know, war against near peers lasts a long time. And it's the one, uh, it's a force that can replace its losses, its maritime losses that win. And here's a challenge to everybody else uh, for both comments to Brian and future thoughts and your own future work is um, a lot of my uh, counterparts, technology determinists, I call them, say, well, it's going to be technology that determines it, determines the outcome of future war. And if anybody knows of a Navy that was substantially smaller, but technolo technologically advanced and defeated a larger, substantially larger Navy in history ever, uh, please let me know because Brian has hit this. This was a campaign of statistics. It was a, can a campaign of re replacing losses. Okay, that's the end of my comment, uh, my, comment my, my uh, lecture for today. Brian okay, did I'm going to take Len. Then I'm going to, you have a question, Richard, don't you? And then I'm going to take yes. um, um, Doug after that. So Len, go ahead. Sure. Uh, I uh, I have a question, but I actually also uh, have a comment prompted by uh, the discussion of the the greatest British failure. I just finished reading through Roskill's uh, British naval policy between the wars, and it was striking to me how the idea that the RAF was going to contribute to the U-boat war by bombing uh, U-boats at the source was ingrained in RAF thinking, even in the middle and late 1930s, when, uh, when the Royal Navy was agitating for more maritime aircraft, the RAF response was basically, don't worry, we'll just bomb them. <laughs> uh, it didn't work out that way. My question uh, is prompted, Brian, by uh, your discussion of the, the resources that were devoted to uh, the maritime war. And the question is this, if the, the real turning point of the war came towards the end of 1941 and the, the German tonnage war became hopeless when the US entered the war, did it make sense for the Germans to continue to devote the resources they did uh, to that war? Was there an opportunity for them to step away at that point and say, maybe we should be doing something else with these resources. Well, I, I think with the benefit of 2020 hindsight, that, that, that answer to that is yes, they, they should have. But, you know, that's 2020 hindsight. You know, at the time, you know, America announced that we've got this grand shipbuilding plan 
uh, where they were talking about building 18 million deadweight tons of, of shipping, like in a two or three, three, three year period of time. I don't remember the exact period. The Germans thought this was bluster. They said, there's no way that the Americans can do this. Uh, well, the Americans actually could do this. So, you know, again, for 2020 hindsight, knowing what we know now, yeah, it, it was kind of a waste of time for them to put the resources that they did into this. But they didn't necessarily realize that at the time because they they did not really contemplate the Americans and to a lesser extent the other allied powers to going to be able to, to, to build shipping at the level that they did. Um, just, just, just one other comment you made too, you mentioned about the bombing. Um, you're, you're absolutely right that for the first part of the war, uh, bombing U-boats, I mean, by the end of the war, a fair number of U-boats are actually sunk in bombing raids. But that you're, you're talking basically the last year of the war. But with the technology that existed for the bulk of this thing, uh, you're, you're right that uh, the idea that we're going to disrupt uh, U-boat production significantly through bombing for the bulk of the war, uh, it really never came to fruition. Okay, Richard, you had a question. Yeah, well, first of all, let me comment that I, I join uh, Evan and, and Sam saying that overall, I was very impressed with the overall performance, the presentation and all the points you made. I was just nodding along. Uh, the only thing I would insert, and this sort of follows along a little bit after what Leonard says, um, there is an issue, though, in terms of resource uh, uh, consumption. Uh, the German maritime effort, even though it was floundering and then failing after 1941, it was also tying down enormous amount of resources of the Allies to counter uh, the maritime threat in the Atlantic and, and wherever. So, in fact, it's, uh, if my memory serves me correctly, when Hitler wanted to dismantle all the surface ships, Dunitz's uh, reply to that was in part, well, you know, we've got to remember that these, however few they are, they are tying down enormous amounts of British resources to contain them. So that's why we need to retain the, the surface vessels. And so if, if you're doing the numbers, then after you show two million Germans tied down in the maritime thing, you know, how many allied uh, men and women and resources were tied down in maintaining the sources necessary to maintain the, the Atlantic uh, life. Yeah, yeah, you know, I don't have an actual number, uh, probably more, uh, probably more, but then I, I would, and I, I agree with you. I mean, the reason they put in an effort though is it's absolutely necessary as, as we discussed. And then later on, uh, but, but I would also submit that the Allies had the ability uh, to be able to put these type of numbers in there, whereas, the, you know, the Germans, they're, they're being pressed from all sides, and it's harder for the Germans to be able to do this uh, than it is, uh, it is for, for the Allies. The Allies have the manpower, they have the resources to be able to dedicate to these applications and still have enough other resources, you know, to bomb the hell out of Germany and, to, you know, put, uh, you know, seven field armies in the Northwest Europe and so on and so forth. I mean, so I, I think the Allies are in a much better position to be able to, to, to put these resources toward this maritime contest than, than what the Germans are, who are being pressed by all sides, if, if that makes sense. Makes sense to me, I think, yes. I think we, Doug was the next question, then we'll take Carlos after Doug. Go ahead. Okay, thanks a lot, Brian. That was a very intriguing presentation. Thank you very much. By the way, my name is Doug. Schauberg Jane is just my enigma code, so disregard that. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm a Minnesotan too, you know. Uh, anyway, I was very interested in the statistics that you had out there and um, how detailed that you uh, found yourself getting into those stats. For example, was it important to understand the nature of the commodities that were sunk? We, you talked in the statistics in terms of ships that lost, but would you equate a 10,000 ton tanker to uh, three 7,000 tons uh, ships carrying blankets and whatever it might be. So I wondered if in your statistical research, you found that there were some breakdowns as to the nature of like, was it fuel oil? Was it personnel? Was it munitions? Was it whatever? And whether that made a difference in the overall statistical analysis? Sure. Well, in, in, in my book, I do go into some degree Talking about, like, like, for instance, we talk about those imports. I break that down into what percentage was foodstuffs, what percentage were oil, what percentage were other type, you know, manufactured items. So I do break that down. And in some cases, when we're talking losses, I break down, you know, what the losses were too. Um, I mean, I don't do this comprehensive 
comprehensively across the entire campaign. Um, and one other thing I will, will point out, though, because I know I got asked this, you know, uh, a different presentation I, I gave one time about, you know, were the Germans specifically targeting specific ships? And I said, by and large, that was not the case. Again, the Germans' goal was to sink ships wherever they can find them as cheaply as they could. Uh, but there was one exception to this, and that was Operation Drumby. When the Germans are operation, operating off the American Eastern Seaboard, and there the pickings were just so ripe that the Germans could pick and choose what they wanted to sink. And in this case, they specifically targeted tankers. And during the first three months of Operation Drumbeat, roughly 50% of all the, I don't know if it's 50% in terms of tonnage or 50% in terms of overall ships, but roughly 50% of the ships that were sunk were tankers because the Germans were specifically targeting them. Um, but by and large, that, that's one example where, yes, they were specifically going after tankers, but more often than not, they're just trying to get past the convoy screens. They're usually operating at night, and then they're going to sink whatever they can sink. Um, that's, what, that's what they're typically going to try and do. The reason I asked that was that in today's day and age, and I don't know if Sam Tangretti has any insight into that, but <clears throat> with the ability for people to cyber uh, uh, assault data, if, uh, if I was able to break into American shipping manifests, et cetera, I would be able to target individual ships on there as to their sure. commodities that they were taking, and that would be a significant increase. So I, I, I imagine some of the data that you gathered on there could have some import for uh, future war fighting. So, you know, there's a, another thing I'd like to interject, and this isn't necessarily related to what we just talked about, but it's kind of related to that uh, conversation about, you know, after a certain point, was this beneficial for the Germans to continue to try and do this? And I would say that, you know, the Battle of the Atlantic, this, this U-boat struggle goes on the entire duration of the war. I mean, the, the British lose their first ship sunk by a U-boat on the first day of the war. And the last week of the war, the Germans are still dispatching U-boats into the Atlantic. But the, the overall emphasis of this campaign switches about um, uh, the first uh, two thirds of the war. Again, they're, they're looking to more of an offensive application where, again, the ultimate goal is to drive Britain out of the war. By the end of the summer of 1943, the Germans realized that, okay, it's not realistic that we're going to drive Britain out of the war anymore. They realized that. But they still continue to pursue this. Part of the reason is, again, they're trying to tie down the resources, as was alluded to earlier. But part of this is because they see the U-boats as their first line of defense in the West. And they know that there's an invasion that's going to be coming. They're trying to keep the Allies spread out, maybe try and impede the buildup in Britain to whatever degree they can. And once the invasion is launched, they're going to try and use the U-boats to counter that. It's, it's mostly a costly failure for them. Um, and then up until the very end of the war, they're still trying to sink whatever they can sink to try and impede the Allied buildup in, in Europe. Um, what they're able to sink is a, a, a pittance compared to the, the flow of, of resources that are coming in. Uh, but they're going to continue to sink for the whole war. But during the final couple of years of the war, the U-boat operations are more seen as a defensive application as opposed to an offensive application, if that makes sense. And the final thing I'll just throw in there is the Germans eventually did hope to return to more offensive um, uh, interdiction operations with the development of their Electra boats, their Type 23, and well, not Type 23, because that was a coastal boat, but their Type 21 uh, ocean-going uh, U-boats. Uh, Fortunately for the Allies, uh, the Type 21 was developed just too late. Had this thing come out in 1944 or 1943, it definitely would have had an impact on the war. Um, and their ultimate goal was to return to these convoy battles uh, with the Type 21s. But, you know, uh, by the time that the, the first Type 21s were ready for operational use, the war was over. Thank you. Well done. Thank you, Doug. I think you, you were the next, Carlos. Yeah, uh, this is a response to Sam's question about technology. I think if you look at the Portuguese off the coast of India in the 1500s and adept use of ship handling and uh, uh, cannon fire, uh, they made circles around the uh, the Mughal fleet, uh, and uh, I think that's a that's a good example for those of you who are into those kind of warfare events. <laughs> It's legitimate. I, I like that example. And you could probably get another one from the Chinese junks and the uh, First Opium War, I imagine. That's kind of an extreme difference. Um, I, I'm not sure the technological differences are that great today. Maybe they're greater. But um, yeah, I, I'll buy that. Sam, do you have any comments on that? 
Just thank you. Thanks, Carlos. I'll keep that one in mind. <laughs> do, we, do we have more questions? <laughs> oh, uh, Vince, this is Doug Schoberg. I just had one to ask if there was any uh, uh, any books out there on the battles fought by the Canadians. I was amazed at the impact that the Canadians have with the number of battles they had. And, you know, Vince, you had a very compelling book written about the Mediterranean Wars and all the small actions that were fought, which I find from a historical viewpoint, extremely dramatic and uh, compelling. And wondered if anything like that was written for the Canadian engagements that were done. Tons. Uh, look up the name Michael Whitby and Blue Water Navy, Canadian official history. Um, there's there's a, actually, there's a Canadian section of my library back there. It's only about 10 books, 10 books big, but there it is. Mark Milner. <laughs> Mark Milner. Yeah, Mark, Mark Milner in particular, yeah, yeah. If you, if you think the British are bad, the Canadians are much worse in terms of feeling that they're neglected. You know, they're not, they're not, uh, they haven't gotten sufficient. Uh, and they're, they're a bit, um, Mark's a bit uh, cross about the British as well, thinking that, you know, the British, the British keep all the, all the good ships on their side of the Atlantic and the <laughs> Canadians get stuck with second rate stuff and, uh, and so on. But um, yeah, the Canadians are, are important. Uh, the, the point that I was going to make kind of relates to what Sam said a little bit about uh, production and, and uh, you know, the, the statistics. And, <clears throat> it, you know, one of the things is that the, the, the German Navy often says, in, or the, the German Navy said at the time was that, you know, if we could, if we could build 100 U-boats uh, um, uh, a year, if we had a, a seagoing fleet of 300 U-boats, it would have won the war. Uh, you know, if, if we'd actually done that, in September 1939, and and, and plowed ahead with U-boat production, and, and I think that, that that may be true. But I think that the, the the way that Hitler and the German High Command saw things was that they didn't want to have a long protracted war. They didn't want you know three or four years of U-boats fighting in the Atlantic, uh, trying to cut trying to cut down the, what the British could bring in. They wanted a decisive victory uh, achieved very quickly uh, on on the continent, and they thought that was possible, not not unreasonably. After after June 1940, so it wasn't really until uh, until they realized that in fact this is going to be a longer war uh, in 1941 or 1942 that they actually did begin to to rationalize production and to rethink uh, rethink what they could what what they would do in terms of building U-boats, but um, I, I think you always have to sort of see how how a great power looks at the war overall. Uh, before you say, well, they should have done this or they should have done that. You know, just it, it, doing building U-boats would have involved a much longer protracted war, which they probably couldn't win on any front, in the, any format. The, the very first um, sailings of the Walther uh, hydrogen peroxide boats took place in 139, and the decision was made to continue the perfectly serviceable submarines they were already using rather than develop this... Um, next war type technology. That was a de deliberate decision made at about the same time as your turning point there, Brian, so. Well, I know that uh, one of the things too, because I know you can what if anything, but what if, if the Germans had 300 new books at the start of the war, would that have made a difference? It would have made a huge difference. But I always counter what if by, you think the British are going to just let the Germans build 300 new books and not respond in kind? Yeah, like really? I mean, of course. What what what, what if the, the British and the French had and not, not been such putt in was it thirty five or thirty six when Hitler goes in the Rhineland and they could shut him down you know right there and then. So you can counter any what if with another what if. Mm -hmm. We have more questions. Bench, Don Patton. Don. Uh, I uh, give a couple of shameless uh, commercials here. I, I hear there's some guys from Minnesota on this and. Uh, we have, uh, except for December, we have run our uh, World War II roundtable in a kind of a closed niche. So if anybody would like to attend, we're, we're having Jay Stout come in in May to talk about the uh, uh, aerial, uh, uh, the bomber offensive in Europe. And another, uh, uh, we're, we're looking at starting off next September and one of the people on this uh, call is uh, Rich Frank, who's going to be our speaker in September. So uh, on his book, uh, Tower of Skulls. But one of my uh, comments uh, is not so much naval, but just diversion of resources. Uh, as I've led uh, battlefield tours to Europe for the last 20 years, I'm, I'm amazed at how much uh, 
steel and concrete were used into building Siegfried Line, Atlantic Wall, uh, the uh, uh, bu bunkers, the underground uh, uh, factories that uh, Germany put into. A lot of it was using slave labor, of course, but uh, tremendous amounts of uh, resources that could have gone into other uh, more productive areas. I, I just question that. It's a good point. And all that, a lot of that stuff is still sitting there on the beaches, isn't it? Yes. 80 years later. Um, we have more questions or comments here. I would like to uh, also, Gary, Gary, you're here, aren't you, Gary? I'd like to also uh, mention that on May 15th, we're going to be holding our next Q&A. And um, Gary will be talking about Sledgehammer in 1942. And maybe you might want to make a comment about that, Gary. I think it's going to be a very interesting um, presentation. presentation. Yeah. Hi. I'm actually dialed in here on two different modes and just trying to get it on my phone. Can you hear me? I can hear you. OK. Well, yeah, thank you. That, that presentation actually allows me to slot, slice a few minutes off of my week or next month. Uh, I was going to go over some of those things. And you did a much better job than I would have done, not even withstanding the lesser uh, amount of time. But uh, so yeah, thanks. Um, so I'm looking forward to next month. But I just wanted to point out that I think one of the main things we have to consider um, with respect to the German uh, contribution in their use of resources is that just the very fact that they were uh, uh, made necessary, the organization of the convoy system was a huge um, contribution, not just in terms of resources, but in terms uh, overall with warships and anti-submarine planes and such. But just the very fact that you had to um, move ships across in convoys cut down on the capacity uh, substantially of you know, the number of ships that could cross in a given amount of time. So, um, I mean, there was some comments made about that, about whether you know, it was worthwhile for them to devote resources as much as they did. And of course, they probably could have uh, still provoked that with lesser amount of resources, but I just think that that's an important aspect to take into consideration. Yeah, you, you, you absolutely raise a very good point. I mean, I was talking in the presentation about, you know, British uh, uh, imports definitely declined for pre-war level. And a big part of that is because of that disruption that you're talking about. It, it, it slows the whole process down when you're having to organize and, and conduct convoys. And the same was true for the Germans bringing their, 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 they're also conducting convoy operations in the Baltic. And a big part of what what's delaying their supply operation isn't necessarily direct losses, but again, it's this, this whole process you have to go through, you know, of clearing the minefields and, and organizing the convoys and so on and so forth. So it definitely has uh, major impacts beyond just the loss that the impact of losses have on, on the overall uh, situation. I just wanted to uh, point out a couple other things in your presentation. I noticed that um, you had a picture of a coaster in, Ant uh, in Antwerp and then mm -hmm. and your picture of uh, the Normandy logistical uh, contribution. Uh, I believe that's another coaster beached on the Normandy shorelines. And so that's something I'm going to be talking about a fair amount uh, next month. So I just want to, you know, highlight that to those who might be tuning in next month. It's, it's kind of an underappreciated, uh, you know, resource from the standpoint of the, um, the allies. Your capability that the allies had that nobody really appreciated even the allies but, until they, I until they into, used it. Yeah, I, I was surprised, surprisingly, I just ran into a quote by Churchill who actually, you know, mentions the, the coaster fleet as being a, a strategic uh, resource that he wanted to leverage, uh, you know, further. And this was in 1943. So just, um, just something we'll... Well, you know, I think something that Evan writes about in his book is, you know, later in the war, a, a very large percentage of the Allied uh, warship production was, was a, you know, uh, amphibious uh, landing craft, um, which again was absolutely necessary. It, 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 again, it's not sexy at all, but uh, it's absolutely necessary in order to carry out all of these these amphibious operations that they're fulfilling. Uh, 
I think it's really sexy. <laughs> I, I, I always thought that the uh, you know the whole the whole family of uh, of Lenin Cab is just so impressive. You know what what's created uh, is is so extraordinary. You know from LSTs on on down. Uh, I mean, I just find that in terms of technical um, adaptation, rapid technical adaptation. And organization of production in inland shipyards and so on. I mean, I just think that's that's uh, you know it is a, it is an ignored story, but I think it's I think it's I think it's a really interesting one. Well, you know, it, it kind of makes an interesting comparison and contrast to what the Germans were proposing to do in Operation Sea Line, towing unpowered barges across the English Channel, <laughs> and, and attempting to be successful doing that when you consider the, the amount of effort that the Allies put into building specialized landing craft thousands um and uh it, it's again uh, just a good comparison of uh, of uh, the different approaches that the two sides took to uh, the, the idea of a major uh, amphibious landing of course you know we, 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 we conducted many of them and the germans you know abandoned uh, uh, uh sea line well the, the germans the germans did conduct one of the most impressive um improvised amphibious operations of the war and, and, you know, going back to one of my, my first question, I, I would consider that to be a, um, kind of a startling failure on the part of, of British maritime power in, in not preventing um, the German occupation of Norway, if, if it indeed it had been possible. True. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I agree. But I, I would think... submit that, that invading Norway is a completely different animal than trying to invade Britain. Well. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Norway is a neutral country. I mean, it wasn't actually defending itself, so it's not really. Uh, I mean, you're, you're right. I, I get, I, I get the point, Vince, but I still think that it's, uh, and it, it, it was a really very impressive operation. I mean, it was, it was like kind of seizing the Crimea, you know, by by by, by Putin. The, you know, the idea that you move in very quickly and you move in so fast that the the Allies can't react, and it's probably because the Allies, the British, were about to do the same thing that there was as much fighting as there was. But yeah, the, I mean, the the conception was 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 remarkable. But I mean. It's the, it's almost the exact opposite of the thorough um, of the thorough development of, Amer of of British and American amphibious technique. It, it is the exact opposite. That's why it was a one-off. I think they were. That's a, that's a British expression, by the way, that I've learned. One-off. That um, <laughs> <laughs> that um, is that right? <laughs> I, I never knew what that meant. I had to ask somebody at one point in my life um, that um, they were not able to repeat it. Not that they had any good opportunities, although I would I would kind of question the German use of sea power in the Baltic in 1941. That's that's something that I think could have been better refined. But again, that's that's a different subject. Do you have any final comments to make, Brian? Uh, no, no. I think I, I've I've expended enough uh, oxygen here in my apartment. Uh, okay. But I'm I'm certainly happy to you know continue in the conversation. But I think people have heard enough of my voice. Thank you, Brian. It's been a very, very, very good presentation, and I, I think we've all learned a lot. We've all we've all enjoyed it, and and with that, I I will go ahead and oh, I see Hal and Hal and, and Doug want to make final comments here. No, Hal does not. I Doug, you get the last word. To, to you get Brian, the last word. Right. I just want to say to Brian from one Minnesota to another, Bravo Zulu, eh? Uh, bravo. <laughs> bravo Zulu. All right. <laughs> okay. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs>